Shabbat Shalom. Let us think back to almost one year ago, to the last time that we as a Jewish community were really all united in thinking about the Exodus. And I am, of course, speaking about the moments that we were gathered around our Seder table, assembled with our nearest and our dearest, reenacting our redemption from Mitzrayim, the straits, these narrow places of life. And we are at the section called the Magid, the telling of the story, the meal is almost there, and the leader lifts up their cup of wine. Now they intone, we dip our fingers into the wine and spill out 10 drops for the 10 plagues that befell the Egyptians. Dam, Tzvardea, right, Dam, blood. What's Tzvardea? Frogs. Frogs, nope, okay, that's it, that's the one. But here's the problem, it's the plague of Frog, 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 Rabbi, you ask, don't you mean frogs? Well, no. A uh, quick Hebrew note that when a noun exists in the plural, unless it's a complex compound noun, a smichut, that word has a specific grammatical ending, often something that sounds like im or ot. And so let's return to that word again, tzfardeya and note that it certainly 100% does not end in im or ot. And then let's, let's go back and let's double check. Let's make sure that it's not one of these rare, unique cases like perhaps the English word deer. What is the plural of deer? Deer. And, and so we'll look into our Torah. We can go to Exodus verse uh, 7, 27, which is on page 387 in our Plat Chumash, if you doubt me. And here we have the precursor to God falling, calling forth this plague, and it states, if you refuse to let them go, I will plague your entire country with frogs. And we look to the Hebrew, batzifar dim. And so there it is. The plural of frog is frogs, and the plural of tzfardea is tzifar dim. And so we hold on, and, and there's more than one or two of you, I think, thinking right now, well, it's just a typo. It's just a typo. It's a mistake in the Haggadah, and the Torah certainly didn't make that mistake as well. And so we'll go to Exodus 8, chapter 2, just a few lines down on page 387, if you're still checking me. And we'll go to the English and the Hebrew, and it says, the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But no, in the Hebrew, it is in the singular. It says, Hatzafardea, the frog. And so this morning we are going to discuss the plague of frog. And the Talmud, of course, notes this grammatical discrepancy in Tractate Sanhedrin and informs us of the opinion of Rabbi Elazar. It was one frog, but it spawned and filled the entire land with frogs which is a lovely, agadic, midrashic solution. One frog becomes many frogs. But it is also subject to a dispute of authorship because Rabbi Akiva is also credited with this teaching. And that, my friends, is a rarity. Not that Akiva should be quoted in the Talmud, that happens all the time, but rather that Akiva should be quoted as engaging in the work of midrash. Imagine for a moment in our world today that the finest legal scholar of the decade, of the age, of all time, put aside their work on law and precedent and authorial intent and decided to write creative fiction and do some light work on puns. It's a shocking break of character. So shocking that the Talmud actually records a conversation between Akiva and Eleazar ben Azariah, who reprimands him and says, Akiva, what are you doing? Get back to working on those serious subjects and leave the Midrash to me. Besides, everyone knows that it was one frog and it whistled, and the other frogs followed it. Or maybe it was one frog and Pharaoh tried to squish it and it turned into a lot of frogs. And that's how you write a Midrash. Later, rabbinic commentary is unimpressed with the Talmudic precedent set by Rabbi Elazar. Hezekiah ben Manoah the Chizkuni who's a 13th century scholar from France, rejects the singularity of the frog and believes that it is indeed frogs 
by going back to the grammar. Yes, he says, all those things about im and ot are true, but when you look at the language of Torah, sometimes a single thing can be used to mean a swarm of that thing. In the book of Numbers, for instance, there's a plague of snakes, and there it uses plural and singular interchangeably. God sends hanachashim, the snakes, but only takes out hanachash. The Israelites wouldn't have been happy if God had only taken one snake out after God sends many snakes. So clearly you should read this with the same understanding. There are lots of places where swarms are described with a singular. Frog and frogs are interchangeable despite the grammar. And Ibn Ezra agrees, but he dives down this rabbit hole in a fascinating way that brings in an entirely new disagreement. He claims that one can translate the word svardeya as two completely different things. One is the common understanding, the one on which we all agree that it is the well-known sound-producing creature found in the majority of riverways. But he says, many say that it is actually a type of water creature called, in the Arabic, altimsach. And that is the creature which is found on the Nile, and it preys there upon its people. Altimsach, the crocodile. Have we had it wrong the whole time? Is the second plague of the Exodus, in fact, the plague of the crocodile? Rabbeinu Bachya, quoting our Torah, alludes to this and says, when the plague ceases, Moses says to Pharaoh, Hatzifardim, these creatures, they will retreat from you and your courtiers and your people, and they will remain only in the Nile. Only in the Nile, picks up the rabbi. Frogs live all over the great waterways of the world. But Altimsach, the crocodile, that's rare. That only lives in the Nile. And there it lives, and sometimes it comes to the edge where it swallows even one, two, or three human beings at a time. And it is of the Tzfardea type. And a fascinating little piece neither spear nor arrow can overcome its body unless aimed for its belly. The conversation isn't over. A Barbanel, a 15th century Portuguese commentator, continues this thread and brings forward the words of Rabbi Hananel, a often forgotten rabbi whose work bridges the age of the Geonim, the end of the time of the Talmud, and the beginning of the period of the medieval rabbis. And Rabbi Hananel famously is the one who believed that the Tzfardea was a crocodile. Though, by the time of the Abarbanel, who's quoting him, his, the opinion has fallen out of favor. So Abarbanel expands this point by going back to the grammar and pointing out that God makes a threat to Pharaoh and says, I will plague your entire country with Tzfardim. Nogef et kol gvulecha. I will plague. And nogef is often translated as plague or strike and smite. And these little water creatures, says the Abarbanel, if you translate the word as frogs, they don't smite people. They don't kill people. They don't nogef people. So the Tzvardea cannot be a smiking, striking, striking sort of plague. Instead, it should be as we describe it in the book of the Psalms, and this is his trump card. His dazed audience cannot believe that their sagely rabbi is arguing with 1,500 years of Jewish tradition that frogs are in fact crocodiles. And they go, the Psalms, rabbi, the Psalms? Yes, cries out a Barbanel. And he plays it and he opens us up to Psalms 78 as the psalmist recalls the plagues which strike the Egyptians. And I quote, and God displayed signs in Egypt, destroying the Egyptians, Tzon turned their waters to blood, made their water undrinkable, inflicted them with swarms of insects to devour them, and Tzifardea to slaughter them. Can your little croaking friends slaughter people? No, says the Abarbanel. Clearly, Tzifardea means crocodile. His friends are not convinced. Doesn't the Torah in that very same verse say, 
and they shall come up and enter your palaces and your bedchambers and your beds and the houses of your people and your ovens and your kneading bowls. What's more likely, that this describes large, monstrous crocodiles sneaking out of the rivers or that it's a pesky swarm of frogs? It takes a few more hundred years for another rabbi to even touch the argument. But in the 19th century, Mayor Leibush ben Yechiel Michael Weiser, better known as the Malbeam, throws his own opinion into the mix in an attempt to finally make some peace. Yes, he says, we have a disagreement about Nogef and whether you should read it as lethal smiting or non-lethal smiting. And yes, we have a disagreement about whether its Fardea is a big creature with big jaws or a little creature that hops and croaks. And so, says the Malbeam, it seems to me, as I understand it, that there are two different species. There's the little ones, and there's the big ones. And the little ones sneak into your house and are a nuisance, and the big ones, those are the ones which stay in the Nile and eat people alive. So maybe both of you are right. And I suppose we could leave it there. But I want to return to the Talmud for one last word. Because this is an important distinction to make when we are talking about the plagues, the 10 plagues specifically. That many modern rabbis and Jewish thinkers today, especially around Passover, like to assemble these think pieces about Pesach and the modern plagues or the plagues that we will see this year in the world. And they fill this list with all the terrible things that are destroying our world, like climate change and human trafficking and the breakdown of civil discourse and baseless hatred. But they miss a very important point, which is that the plagues are ultimately on our side. The plagues are on our side. The plagues are on the side of the Israelites, transforming an unjust world of slavery and exile into a world of redemption and covenant. The plagues are terrible, and we do spill out our wine. We do reduce our joy as we remember them. But the plagues are ultimately heroic symbols of God's power to overturn tyranny, of the need for sometimes unpleasant things to occur in our world to make it a better place. And in the Talmud, in Tractate Psachim, the rabbis decide to make this point even more clear. Ta shma, they say. Come in here. Remember the prophets of God from the book of Daniel. Remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. What did they see that gave them the courage that they allowed themselves to be thrown alive into a fiery furnace, believing that God would save them, knowing that they could make Kiddush Hashem, that they would sanctify God's holy name. What do you think it was? The frogs. The frogs, says the Talmud. For the frogs were not obligated in the mitzvot. There is no Torah for frogs. There is no breed with the frogs. And yet the frogs come up and they went into the ovens they went into the houses. They went into the kneading bowls. The frogs throw themselves into the fiery furnaces of the Egyptians, say the rabbi, so that God's beloved people can go free. And kol v'chomer, all the more so for us and for our great prophets. Because if the frogs who have none of the promises or the blessings or the relationships with the divine, if they are willing to risk their own lives, and their own safety, their own comfort, to see a world redeemed, and to be a part of the freedom of the Jewish people, to demonstrate their faith in God. Well, what can we do that would be any less? The frogs. Shabbat shalom. Shalom.